All right, folks, in this video, we're going to talk all about deformation. Deformation being a general term applied to any time a rock changes its shape. So we've done force and stress before. Let's uh, just kind of remind you again here. Force, again, a push or a pull expressed as an amount of acceleration experienced by a mass, right? So uh, force of gravity, right? Uh, pounds per square inch, right? Those are all forces, right? So let's take a look at these two wooden pillars, right? Um, the force, right, or, or, you know, the pressure is is basically the force per area, right? So taking the same force, the same weight, putting on these two different blocks, obviously we'll get different results because this block is much larger and that, that force or that weight is spread out more, right? So again, stress is our force per, per unit area. Force being, you know, an acceleration times a, a mass. Um, and then stress being that, that force divided by the area over which the force is applied, right? So again, talked about this several times. We have a couple different kinds of uh, stress. We have confining pressure, right? Same the pressure of burial, same uh, uh, equal pressure in all directions. And then we have differential stress, right? One direction is, is much more intense than the other directions of stress. And this is the force we experience uh, at plate tectonics, right? So what happens when we apply a stress to a rock? Well, small stress, nothing's going to happen. The rock can take it, right? We start to increase the stress, right? The rock might start to bend or deform and eventually will, we'll, we'll, you know, exceed that rock's ability to maintain that stress or exceed its failure envelope, if you will, right? And we'll get, we'll get a failure. Um, and that would be deformation, right? So uh, as you know, deformation, we have two different kinds. Basically, we have brittle deformation or fracturing and cracking, right? And then ductile deformation, uh, which is bending and flowing. So this happens, um, this change happens as we go deeper into our earth. Remember, more heat, more pressure, the deeper you go. So rocks at or near the surface tend to be affected by this brittle uh, deformation, where rocks at depth tend to be you know, affected by ductile deformation, right? This is causes the rocks to flow in a solid state, and that, of course, is metamorphism, right? Uh, this little line here is our, our failure envelope, right? And remember, as we go deeper in our earth, heat and pressure mean, you know, uh, get get more intense, but uh, so that, that rock can take a little more pressure at depth because it's got more confining pressure around it, right? So this is our failure envelope. You pass that envelope, and you cause deformation whoops so how does rocks respond to this force and stress you know again small amounts unchanged right or you know we can cause displacement as we see you know along this fault here right we can cause rotation or uplift right taking those those originally horizontal sediments and uplifting them or tilting them right and we can cause strain, right? So we can cause these, 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 uh, you see these pebbles in here have been kind of elongated and lineated out due to that, that kind of more plasticky, you know, uh, um, ductile deformation. Right? So again, three kinds of stresses in the resulting structures, right? First, we have compressional stress which we see at convergent margins, tensional stress, which we see at divergent margins, and shear stress, which we see at uh, uh, transform boundaries, right? So at shallow levels, this is gonna result in fracturings of the rock, right? We'll get faults or we'll get joints, which is where the rock kind of just splits apart, right? Or then we get, you know, all different types of faults here. So here we have a reverse fault, this is a, a jointing, and then we have uh, strike slip fault over here, right? Deeper levels of rocks, instead of instead of breaking, right, and creating a fault, we're going to bend and create, you know, kind of a bow in the rock, right? Um, so tensional forces, deeper levels, instead of, you know, pulling apart and jointing them, right, we're going to stretch or uh, lineate or elongate some of these, these features in there, right? And at depth, right, instead of creating, a, again, a fault, we're going to create more of a, a plastic fluid kind of, 
of a, a boundary, right? So again, these are our shallow or our brittle types of deformation associated with compressional, tensional, and shear. And these are our, our deep level or ductile deformation associated with compression, tension, and shear. So here we look at, at shallow depths, right? We see brittle breaks and cracks and fractures, right? Whereas at great depths, and here we have a folded gneiss, right? This is a gneiss that has been folded, right? The rock is more taffy-like and it's going to fold and bend and flow as opposed to break and crack. Right? So, whoops. So at shallow uh Depths, maybe we have uh, these low temperature minerals may be unaffected, but we can see all these nice cracks and, and, and stuff in them that are showing that probably jointing or expansion, right? Where at depth, you know, these minerals are going to recrystallize or metamorphose into new mineral grains. So let's talk about some of these different types of fractures we can get in rock. So the joint is where a crack is kind of pulled apart, right? It shows kind of we have a, a space issue, not enough space, so we're going to kind of pull apart or break. Right. Here's an example of sets of these joints. You can see them running parallel to each other here, right? And that has to do with, you know, that that specific tensional or divergent type of, of force, right? Or stress. Uh, we can also have faults. We discussed these in other chapters, right? This is where the rocks have slipped past one another, right? As we see here, this part and this part used to be together, right? So the hanging wall has moved down relative to the foot wall. So this is a normal fault showing, again, extension, right? So stresses that form joints, we can form, you know, tectonic stresses, right? These are, you know, we can create all sorts of fractures uh, as, it, as it gets buried in, in that uh, brittle deformation zone, right? Cooling and contraction, these can form, we saw mud cracks forming like these, but we can also form columnar basalts. So notice we have this very hexagonal shape to these. This is natural. This is as these, this basalt, which is an igneous rock, right, um, extras of igneous rock, as it cools, it contracts, and it tends to contract back on itself and form these beautiful hexagonal uh, uh, shape columnar basalts is what they're called, right? So this shows cooling and contraction or we can also get unloading right that piece of granite that's happy at depth now he's on the surface all that pressure has been removed slowly very slowly he's going to expand or unload and we get what we call onion skin peeling where it kind of breaks off like layers of onion right so looking at compressive stress, right? So compressional forces, right? So as we start to intensify these forces, right? No change start to bulge right we're gonna eventually reach the failure point of that rock and we're going to fail right any farther you know compressional stress is going to result in slip on that fault or slip on that failure right and then we may have to need to develop sets of these faults to you know accommodate all the um all the stress right so describing faults we've done this before i'll just go over quickly strike direction right that is the the uh the the uh planar expression on the surface of that fault right what direction north south east west is it running right dip direction on the other hand is is always perpendicular to strike right always runs straight down the dip of that slope right and those two strike and dip then define that that fault plane right so we can have slip right on like on strike so here's you know a long strike this would be our strike slip or transform boundary we can have slip along dip which are going to be our reverse and normal faults and then we're not dealing it with this in this class but of course we can have a little bit of both and these are called oblique slip faults right parts of a fault again we have the hanging wall this is the part that you can hang from we have the foot wall this is the part that you can stand on so the bottom of the fault and the top of the fault right so hanging wall on top foot wall on bottom how those move relative to each other, right, makes it uh, either a normal or a reverse fault. Normal showing tension and extension, right? Reverse fault showing compression uh, and um, and shortening and thickening, right? This would be a reverse or a large area thrust fault, which is just a low angle, large region uh, reverse fault, right? Strike slip faults, we can... Uh, uh, you know, determine uh, or call these what we call um, a left lateral or a right lateral uh, strike slip fault. So if you were standing on this side of the fault 
and you looked across the fault line, which which way does that fault line look like it has gone? Here it looks like it's gone left and works on both sides actually, right? So uh, here we have, uh, if you stood on this side and looked over here, it also would look like it goes left, right? Right lateral would be the opposite where if you're standing on this side, it looks like it went right instead of left. Right? Now at depth, we can create other interesting features, right? Instead of creating um, faults, we create folds, right? So layers can be folded, right? And then eroded, right? Uh, at depth, right? Now, two different parts of a fold. The part that domes up is called an anticline. And the part that domes down is called a syncline. Right, an anticline. If we notice, we think about how our rocks are originally laid down. You know, oldest at bottom, younger, younger, younger. If you look at this anticline. The oldest rocks are at the center, and the youngest rocks are on the outside of this this anticline structure. The opposite is true on a syncline. Right. So on syncline, we have the youngest rocks at the center of the structure, right, and the oldest rocks on the outside of the structure. Right? So if you're walking across an anticline, you go younger, older, older, right? And then we go into the syncline, we go older, younger, 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 right? So there's an anticline in all its glory. Oldest rocks towards the center, right? Younger rocks towards the outside. Here's a syncline, right? Youngest rocks towards the center, oldest rocks towards the outside, right? We can also create domes and basins. Now, domes are created usually when there's a big uh, magma intrusion known as a lacolith underneath an area. That's going to cause the area above it to dome up kind of like a pimple, right? And then we can have the opposite where it forms basically a bowl, and this is called a basin. And actually right here in Michigan, we are living in one of these sedimentary basins. Basically what happens is sediments are shed into this basin and due to their own weight, they push the basin down, right? So as more sediments come in, the basin gets pushed down, and we get basically this bowl-shaped uh, formation, right? There's another interesting feature called a monocline. This is kind of like an anticline, but it's just where we only have one half of it. This results because of a fault that hasn't fractured all the way to the surface yet. An example of a monocline kind of dipping from horizontal down into that monocline, right? To talk about folds, right, we have the axis of the fold, or we call it the hinge, right, and then each side of the fold is called a limb, right. We can have different types of folds. We can have plunging, right. We can have an upright fold, right, where this axial surface from one layer to the next, that hinge line stays at the same spot, right. Uh, remaining vertical, right? We can have an asymmetric fold where it's tilted, where those those uh, hinge lines from individual layers don't stand straight up, right? And we can have an overturned fold in which it's so asymmetric it's actually turned over on top of itself, right? We can also get rock cleavage. I know we have mineral cleavage, but stressors into the rock can cause basically cleavage planes within these different rocks, right? So stresses like this is going to cause a cleavage plane in that direction. Here's an example of these different rock cleavages all parallel to each other. And that is just due to the stress that has been added, right? Foliation we talked about already. We can have schistosity, nisic foliation. We can get flattened and elongated pebbles at depth. These are all happening with uh, um, um, uh, uh, ductile deformation. And then we can have foliation uh, that develop from shearing. And you, these are these little guys here. These are called algen or eyes. And uh, they're little feldspar crystals that have been kind of sheared or smeared along as this rock is being stretched and foliated, right? Lineation, we can have oriented minerals, stretched crystals, shearing marks as, as things slide past each other, right, on faults, right? And then there's some other cool things that can get preserved in metamorphic rocks. Here's a quartzite that preserve ripple marks in it. That's kind of fun, right? We get shear zones along faults right where that fault is acting. You can imagine the rock right in there is just getting beat up and mangled and mashed and destroyed, right? We can also get those elongated pebbles that then get folded and bent. So these used to be nice little pebbles, right? Then they got elongated stretched and those stretched ones got folded, right? And then we can have deformed foliation as well. So here's nice that has been deformed, right? Been been folded as well, right? 
All right, I hope you enjoyed deformation, folks.